to page 20. Page 20. Mark 113? 21. Or 21 on yours, 20 on mine. <laughs> See, I shrunk mine's up. <laughs> and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and was with the wild beasts, and the angels ministered to him. And what can leaders expect when you're going through those? And, and I'll tell you this. Every leader goes through those dry times. When God, what happens is this, it's a, it's a phenomenon. God is so close that you can't hardly stand in his presence, but he seems so far away that you feel that, is he hearing me? Is he paying attention to me? And, and, and I notice what he says in this process. He was in the, in the wilderness for 40 days. That means it's limited. Your time should be limited in the wilderness. Tempted by Satan, that's one of the expectations you need to guard against, that the devil's not going to leave you alone, especially when you're in those dry times, those wilderness times, those desert places. The devil loves to come and mess with you, especially when you're not feeling real super spiritual, like you want to get up and dance in the spirit and carry on and, and do all those things, and, and it's a drudgery to open your Bible to read it, and you, you try to pray in the spirit, and you can't hardly get the words out, and you you wonder if it's you or if it's the Holy Ghost or, you know, the devil just loves, loves to come and play with you. See that? God ain't with you. You ain't talking in God's tongue. That's a devil, <laughs> you know. And all these things, he'll come and play with you. He, he'll bring people into your world to, 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 to tempt you. I remember uh, Robert Thompson when he was in that one hotel room celebrating and he turned down visiting with a man. He said, no, I don't have time to visit with you today. I'm celebrating Jesus today. And the man came back the next day real angry. He said, now, are you celebrating Jesus today? He said, no, today I'm eating. <laughs> you know, and, and it so happens that the man had brought him a check, a very large check. He had sold his whole herd of, of cattle, uh, the Holsteins, <laughs> sold the whole, the whole herd, and brought the check to give it to Robert to feed the orphans in South Africa. So you never know. So you get tempted. By Satan. And you're going to be with the wild beasts. But by that, I, I mean this. There are going to be people that are going to come to you in your desert experience. They're going to try to tear you up and tell you what's wrong with you. And why the reason you're going through that is because you're not hearing God or, or you miss God or, or you sin. One of the craziest things that ever happened to David Wilkerson was when his wife was needing to have surgery because she was needing to have breast surgery. And he got such vicious letters from the body of Christ. You would think the body of Christ would say, we're praying with you. We, 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 we believe that God is going to touch your what? No. If you was a man of faith, you would have prayed and that cancer would have went away. You know, attacking him and his wife. <laughs> and they're just trying to get through this painful time in their lives. You know, and sometimes when you're going through situations like this, there's always somebody that's a wild beast, ready to tear you up, ready to just devour you, if you will, and destroy you so you can't survive. But now watch, during those times, and the angels ministered to him. God will send his ministering angels and surround you. I was walking around this sanctuary yesterday evening, and I could feel... The two angels just walking beside me as I was walking around praying. And I knew that God had, because I was really feeling weak. I had been struggling all week. Uh, some of you know that I'm battling uh, with hepatitis. And, and now my body gets cold and it gets hot. And, and I'm really wrestling with it. And this has not been a good week for me physically. Uh, some of you understand that. Uh, but I could feel the two angels just lifting my arms. And I'm walking around. I, I finished my time, brother. I stayed here for the whole thing, you know. Uh, but you got to keep pressing in. You can't stop because you're feeling this or you're feeling that or it's, it's raining outside. You know, we had a little uh, a grandma, a little Filipino grandma. I love to tell that story because she walked out of the jungle to catch the bus out to the bus line. She walked for an hour just to get to where there's a bus stop. She rode for an hour into town 
to get to church, stayed in church all day long till 10 o'clock at night, rode the bus out to her bus stop and then walked for an hour through the jungle to get back to where she lived. And I'm thinking, man, we won't even go out in the rain. <laughs> you know? Uh, uh, so it's perspective, how you see things. Psalm 78, 19, yes, they spoke against God. They said, can God prepare a table in the wilderness? See, when the devil messes with you in the wilderness, you may begin to question God. God, is this really you? I thought you was a loving God, a caring God. You know what? What's wrong with you, God? Look, I'm going through this stuff, and I'm doing without, and I'm sacrificing. And, and we, we start questioning God. Uh, you know, can you, can you provide a table for us in the wilderness? God, look at us. Psalm 78, 52. But he made his own people go forth like sheep. And what did he do? He guided them in the wilderness. See, God will guide you through the process but you have to allow him to guide you through that process. He cannot guide you if you won't follow. If you get stubborn enough to think you know everything there is to know and don't want to follow, you'll get stuck in the desert. And guess what? The desert is a dangerous place in the night season. It's cold, and the jackals, and the snakes, <laughs> and the everything. That's why he said he was a cloud by day, and a pillar of fire by night. The pillar of fire helped to keep the wild beast away. Anyone getting near no fire? They're smart enough. When they do in Africa, in the deep jungle, they start fires when they go to bed at night. Keep the lions away. And keep some of the wild beasts away. Uh, and so he said, he guided them in the wilderness. What we need to learn to do is recognize his guidance. I, I do, maybe one of the seminars we'll do here this year, uh, either in this area or your area or whatever, wherever God says, I, I do this, uh, this whole uh, seminar on hearing the voice of God. And I'm amazed how many people don't know how to hear God except but one way. So God is talking in all these different ways and we're not hearing him because we got one way that we want to hear God. And we lock into that way. Now, we know God talks through his word, and I like that. But then I also realized when I study the word that there are many other ways that he chose to speak. And I have to be sensitive to hear the Holy Spirit. And in the desert is one of those times when I have to be sensitive to hear his guidance. Nehemiah 9.19. Yet in your ma uh, manifold mercies, and it takes a lot of mercies, Yet in your manifold mercies, you did not forsake them in the wilderness. Say it with me. He did not forsake them in the wilderness. If you're faithful, he'll be there with you. If God is for you, the Bible says what? Who can be against you? Isaiah said he's your re-reward. Or he stands behind you like he did when we was in Brazil and, and Jesus Christ stood behind us like a mighty warrior with his helmet and a flaming sword. And a young uh, drug dealer from off the streets came running down the aisle and gave his heart to Christ. Because God allowed him to see Jesus Christ standing behind us. He's an ungodly man. He wasn't even looking for God. He was mocking the whole service. And yet when God opened up his eyes... He knew what to do. <laughs> I'm going to serve that guy. I'm going to serve him. Man, he showed up and he's big. He got a flaming sword. I'm going to serve him. Amen. Uh, all right. Let's talk a little bit about release. Being released. Finally, your journey in the, in the wilderness ends. And somebody said, amen. <laughs> God, thank you, Jesus. It's over. But guess what? You're going to go to your mountain, you're going to hear God, and then to get to your next place of victory, you got to come off the mountain and go through the desert to get to the next place. <laughs> what happens is this, which, uh, which will bring me back to that one point I wanted to share with you on the, on the provision. What happens is this, when God finally gets us isolated, and we're up here on top of the, um, the mountain, Mount Horeb, and we're hearing from God and God's glory. Oh, man, hallelujah. And they were there for 
over a year and a half. How many of you know you can get really comfortable in the presence of God? Yeah, I like it here, man. What's down there? Desert, sand, snakes, jackals. Oh, you go, I'm staying. <laughs> Hallelujah. But then he said to them, you have been here long enough. In other words, God said, your wilderness training is done here. You've come to the highest place you could come, face to face with God. Now, I want to take you over there to the battlefield, Canaan. Because Canaan is in heaven. I know we heard all them Southern Gospel songs about we're going to go to Canaan and be to see the king. I'm sorry. When we, when we get to Canaan, we're going to battle. <laughs> this is our Canaan here, man. Because Canaan doesn't represent heaven in the Bible. Canaan represents a land that needs to be possessed in which there's warfare. So they, they get off the mountain and they come to the camp. And it's going to happen again. It's a cycle. And those who learn to walk inside that cycle walk very powerful. It's like writing music. Sometimes it flows real easy. You sit up to a piano or you, you can be, I can be sitting in a restaurant and, 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 and waiting for my lunch and I'm writing. Or I go to somebody's church and they're, they're making announcements and I'm, I'm writing songs. And other times I'm just waiting on God. Because it, it just ain't coming. You try, you know, you try to be real spiritual. God, I think this is a good song. God said, nope, that ain't it. <laughs> you know, and then you, go, you move on to something else. And so uh, there's that process. Now, let me, let me hit on this point so, because I don't want to forget it. Covenantal provision. You usually get that. Over here in this warfare place, mature place, the possession. Wilderness provision. Manna. Water. Every day. Every day. The Bible said every day there was what? Manna. They had to go and pick it up. At the end of the day, if they didn't pick it up, it what? And if they picked up too much to save for the next day, what? Except if they picked up double on the sixth. See. But they had to go out there every, every day and believe for that. That's wilderness provision. A lot of Christians live on wilderness provision. God, I need a miracle. Oh, God. Oh. Jesus, do it. Penny electric today, Jesus. Hallelujah. I need shoes for my kids, Lord. Hallelujah. That's all wilderness. When you get into the place of promise, Hallelujah. whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap. That's the covenant. They were to live, what, off the land. The seed was planted. It all grew up all around them. And God reminded them, always take a portion and set it aside for planting. And you will always have harvest. You can go out in your field. Oh, there it is. Abraham had it. He had covenantal provision. If you read the story of Abraham, and, and we want to pass on. If you read the story of Abraham, Abraham only prayed for one thing that I find. You can, read, you can go home and read Genesis. Only one thing he prayed for. Lord, if there be 50. Lord, if there be 10. Or, or 40, if there be 30, if there be 20, if there be 10. I never find Abraham asking God, Lord, I need some silk. I need some more sheep. Lord, what's wrong with you? I, mean, I, want, I want to be prosperous. I need some sheep. He never asked God for provision. Why? Because he had a covenant with God. He had a covenant. He had no need to ask God because he was in a covenantal relationship with God. And God said, I am your God and you are my child and I will take care of you. You're my, God said, you're my responsibility in covenant and I will take care of you. Many of you could give testimonies to the provision and the way that God takes care of you. Just does it. Miraculously. But then he says, listen, there's this covenant thing in which you can give all of your attention to the work that needs to be done and not worry about the things that need to be taken care of. 
See, there's things that need to be taken care of that's in God's hands. And then there's work that needs to be done that he's put in our hands. So if we go and labor, God will do what? Provide for the things over here. He knows your kids have to eat. He knows you need to pay tuition. He knows you need to pay rent. He knows you need to uh, you know, do whatever to manage your life, health care, whatever you're doing. He knows that. You have a covenant with him, and he wants to provide that. But the basis of that activation of that covenant is whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap. In other words, we, re- we remember God. God, you blessed us with so much, we, w- we take this much, and we set it aside for you. And we do it consistently, never, never failing. If, if it's 10 cents, I'll, I'll give you my penny. If it's a dollar, I'll give you my dime. If it's 100, I'll give you my, you know, my, 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 my what, one dollar? You, know you know what's funny? And I always like to say it. When numbers get larger, our fists get tighter. <laughs> Why is it? You know, we find it easy to give a tenner. You know, God bless you with a hundred. I give ten, man. God, that's crazy. But let God give you ten thousand. And then you start thinking, a thousand? I got to pray about this, Jesus. <laughs> and the larger the numbers get. See, we don't know the temptations of peop- very wealthy people. They're tempted too. Millionaires and the billionaires, they're tempted just like we're tempted when we don't, all we got is cotton on the bottom of our pocket. (laughs) There it is. (laughs) You know, uh, but they're tempted too because they have to manage this large mass of amount and if they're believers in Christ, they become givers. Like one of the the gentlemen that owns uh, some very famous hobby shops across America, he, he, I believe at last count, he was given nearly 60% of his income to the kingdom of God. Is that, that's why his shops are still open. That's why people are still working for him. Because he's what? He's got this covenant thing going. Okay, everybody got that now? Covenant? Because I'm planting. For, uh, I'm doing something for the future. Wilderness? Because I'm doing nothing for the future, but I'm totally... Believing that somehow God's going to have mercy on me. <laughs> and he will. He's a merciful God. But listen, let's get out of relying on the mercy and let's get out of relying in the covenant. All right. There was a man sent from God. John 1, 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Isn't it ironic how many ordinary people God chooses, like you and me, that he chooses and picks us out? And you would think, boy... Why didn't God choose them? They're better qualified or, or they have more time or, or, or this, this person could do a better job or, or they're a better preacher or, or they're a better teacher or they have more uh, you know, access to people. But God says, I need a John. I need a wiry, fiery prophet, evangelist who is unashamedly going to stick his finger out in the face of sin. And call it like it is. And some people won't do that. The early days of Pentecost, the story is told of the, the founder of the Bible school in Findlay. The, from one of the first Pentecostal Bible schools. And he was going to take one of his students to go and show him how to make pastoral calls. He was a veteran pastor and now come into Pentecost. And he took one of his wiry Bible school students. Big mistake. So he goes there, and he does the protocol, the pastoral protocol. We all do. We go to the hospitals, you know. You pray. You, you read the scriptures. And this, this veteran pastor, dean of the school, is doing all the, the protocol. And, you know, we pray. We lay hands. And, and this young student, I mean, he's, he's ready to go. He's, he's, he's got ants in his pants. I mean, he just can't wait. And, and when this guy gets done, he jumps up on the bed grabs the guy by the shoulders and starts shaking him. Come out of him, you devil! Get out of his body, I said! And the man was healed. And this guy talked to that boy all the way back to school. You know, well, you don't, that's not the way, that's not the way you do it! What's wrong with you? You know, this is a, this is a very influential man in Finley. He said, well, he got healed, didn't he? <laughs> that's the whole point. God chooses. God chooses. Matthew 3 and 1. And in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness. 
Sometimes your ministry will start in a strange place. Sometimes we think it's going to start with the multitude. And it may start in the wilderness of one person. The Ethiopian found, was found by one person. Philip the Evangelist, caught up in the spirit, found this one man and a whole nation was revolutionized because he found one man who found Christ who went back to his nation and preached the gospel. Just never know. We have reached, when I, I preached in Brazil, one of, the, one of the young men I led to the Lord Jesus Christ was a young man. He was on his way to a drug deal and walked by the church on a Sunday night. This is my last night in Brazil on my, this trip. I'm ready to go to the airport. I didn't even want to preach. I'm afraid I'm going to miss my plane. I ain't got no money to change my ticket. You know, and they said, no, you got to preach before you go to the airport. I said, okay, but so I'll preach. And this man came walking by, and he came inside the church. And the reason he came inside the church was this. A voice said to him, that is the Holy Spirit, said to him, if you go to that drug deal, you will die. You need to go in this church. So he climbed inside the church. And the next thing you know, one of the deacons had grabbed him by the arm. And the next thing you know, he was standing before the pulpit with his arms raised up in the air, hanging on to the rail and crying out for Jesus to save him. And then Jesus said to me, tell him, I said, I'm going to raise him up as one of the great youth evangelists in this nation and help to revolutionize the nation of Brazil, the youth of that nation. And I thought, whoa, because God plainly said it to me. He said, for this one soul, I sent you to this nation. Think about it. For this one soul, I sent you to that corner. For this one soul, I sent you to Walmart. For this one soul, I sent you to Lowe's. For this one soul, I sent you to the Giants or whatever, wherever God leads you. You never know. Send you to that gas station you never stopped in. But maybe the Holy Spirit arranged it for somebody to be there that needed to know what you know. And so, you know, you, God arranges destinies in the wilderness. Romans 10, 15. And how shall they preach unless they're sent? We got to start sending. One of the things that I've seen in the body of Christ in these last 30 years, we've lost our sending spirit. Nobody wants to go. Everybody wants to stay and celebrate. Celebrate, Jesus, celebrate. No, 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 no. Everybody, let's go to, man. Have you got your ticket yet? Oh, I'm going to that conference, man. And I'm going to that conference, and I'm going to that. Have you been sent yet? I'll get there after a while, but i got to go to. Hello? The, the, we've lost our sense of mission. I think pastor's going to, uh, I think he told me he might even preach about it uh, tomorrow here. The sense of sin, go, do something. You've been sent by the Father. How? Shall they preach unless they are what? Sent. And some of them can't be sent because the body of Christ isn't willing to send them. I used to be a Assembly of God pastor. Assemblies of God is a great missionary organization. For all the things that can be said, they're one of the greatest missionary organizations. They have some of the best equipped missionaries in the world. Now, they would come home from their field, wherever they were at, Africa, South America, Europe, and they would have to spend six months to a year begging the body of Christ for some crumbs so they could raise their budget before the organization would send them back because you have to raise your budget before you go. You have to have enough for plane tickets to return in case you have an emergency, you have to have enough to pay your salary for that year. You have to raise all of that. So they would go from church to church, almost begging, almost pleading with people, please, 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 please. Kind of like the cartoon, you know, please, 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 please. Uh, and, and people would give sometimes, and, and, and then some people would just look at them like, I only support what's happening in America. That's because we don't know the whole concept of world evangelization. So they would spend a whole year almost wasted that they could have spent on the mission field in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, preaching the gospel. 
And I used to hate to see them coming. I would always raise the budget before they got to my, the churches I was pastoring. I would always have their money. I said, I don't want you to talk about money. I got your money. I've raised it. Why? Because it's biblical. Second Corinthians says, Paul said to them, you make sure that all the offerings are taken before I get there for the work that's necessary in Jerusalem. That's preparation. So that when it happens, you're there. Amen? A lot of them are not sent because they, 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 there isn't the resources. And sometimes there's the resources, but people don't catch the vision. And so you have that particular problem. Matthew 9.38. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Now, if I was to ask everybody here to raise their hand, how many of you in the last 24 hours prayed to the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers? How many of us could raise our hands? Think about it. And yet, Jesus commanded that we pray, Lord, send forth laborers. Into, it should be a part, just like our Lord's prayer. It should be a part of our daily praying. Father, raise up laborers. I may not be able to go, Father, but if I can give, I'll give. You know, if I can't give, I'll pray. But I know you need laborers. I can't tell you how many times I've invited pastors from all across America to go on the mission field with me. And many of them wouldn't go because we, we wasn't going to give them any offering when they got there. Could you imagine? I'm taking you to a people who ain't got no money. But you won't go and preach to them unless they can give you an offering. Does that make any sense? Doesn't make any, I, I've had a lot of great preachers. Man, I'll go on a mission field with you and I'll, I'll do this. I said, well, you got to pay your own way and don't expect any offerings. Now, I've been in the nation of, uh, of the Philippines and I go to some churches that can give you an offering. I go to Deval. And there are churches there that have two or 3,000 people in their congregations. And they, they'll give you a lot. I had a youth meeting. Listen at this. I had a youth meeting. It's how powerful. There's 1,200 kids, high school, junior high, and college kids in this meeting on a Friday night in Deval. Powerful stuff. Gave an altar call. It had an area about this big, just full of bodies moving in the Holy Ghost. They took an offering, and kids took off their watches and put them in the offering. They took their cell phones and put their cell phones in the offering for me. I wept, gave all the cell phones back, gave all the watches back. I said, I don't need that. You know, and they said, well, you got to take something. And so I took the, 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 the paper money and the coins that they gave me, and we used that mostly to give it back to the pastors who were in our feeding station so they could feed kids. But think about it. The ones that didn't have anything were willing to give even their... You know what a cell phone means to a teenager? Yeah. <laughs> who's texting. Now, you have to understand, here we talk on them. In, in Asia, they text on them. Everybody texts. You see them on the street corner. You see them in the airport. You see them at the mall. That's the only way they know how to talk is to text, 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 text. And they're buying time so they can text some more. So that's the way to communicate. That tells me something about their passion to want to see something done. Now, this particular youth group, this particular, and by the way, at the end of each section of your manual, there's a reflection section where, which you can write in uh, uh, after you get a chance to reflect on what's going on. Another thing I'd like to remind you before I forget when I'm thinking about it, there's, uh, there's going to be uh, some recordings of this. If anybody would like to purchase some, you can see Michael. He's in the back. He's getting them, some of them ready right now. And hopefully you'll have it all, the whole package for you. You can take home. Uh, but uh, see, we, we somehow, we got to get back to the sending part. Which means that the body of Christ has to learn how to create budgets for sending. Is that true? Can't buy a plane ticket for nothing. Is that right, my brother? You can't, you can't, you can't, you know, you want to go to Mexico? It's going to cost you something. You want to go to Costa Rica? It's going to cost you something. If, if they grace you with a, with a favor or a gift, feel blessed. I had a pastor, one of my pastors in the Philippines, 
He sent me the tithe for the month from his church. I got the envelope, opened up the little note. This is the tithe from my church for the whole month. You know what he sent me? He sent me, uh, if I remember right, it came to 62 cents. That's all the little bit he can squeeze in there, you know. That's, you know, that's hard. Nothing. You know, think about it. When their dollars are, what, uh, 42.3 to 1 right now, and they, they send me, you know, 62 cents worth of that whole thing. And he was so proud. I said, I, I send him back a million times more than that because it broke my heart. But he remembered, if we're going to have laborers come, we want to help them. If we want to have laborers go, you've got to help them. That's the problem. Leaders, good leaders understand that process. Over at Pastor Jeff John's, they understand that process. They help people all over the world and keep people going all the time. And they create a particular budget to take care of that. Good leaders understand, if we're going to grow, we have to plant in the nations of the earth. Send seed. Send warriors, train, develop, ready to go. The challenge of leadership. History is filled with instances when powerful leaders have failed to meet the challenge of the future. If you stagnate, you would die. There's something I'm, I'm wrestling with as I'm praying with. And, and, and I hope that I can communicate it correctly in the body of Christ. One of the dangers of, uh, of, 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 of getting in the move of God is that sometimes we lock in to a particular flavor of doing things. So if God decides to break out of that, we don't know how to do it. It frightens us to, man, this is where God is moving. Why do I want to? Yeah, but God says, listen, out here, there's a bigger circle. We said, no, man, but this is... And sometimes we want to do antiquated things and hope that God will bless them when God has moved on. Now, the principles of God, listen, the principles of God are absolutes. They never change. The application of the principle. Computers were great in the beginning. But how big and bulky. <laughs> I took a computer class and they had a picture of the first computer. How'd you like to carry that around, you know? I'm going to take this on the job, huh? You know, this is my computer. And you never wanted to advance. And here everybody else is walking around with the little laptops. And now they get got little phones that are whole computers, you know? And you can wire it up to your printer. And, and it's going to get even more wild than that. It's the same principle. It's doing something, but it has advanced. It has grown. It has developed. It's exploring how we means and ways to apply that. that has, that's the way it has to be in the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit. We have to be able to know what the principle is, but we have to find out how is God applying that principle to every situation. It's not the same in every city. It's not the same in every town. You don't work the same way in the Midwest that you do in Philadelphia. I guarantee you, you don't. You go to New York City, it's a different style. It's a very aggressive evangelism. You go out in the Midwest, it's a little softer evangelism. You're out there with the cornfields. You go to New York City or Philadelphia or Pittsburgh, you in the concrete jungle. They, they, they pull knives out on you. I was preaching in Pittsburgh where the guy walked in the door and was loading his gun. And the sister was singing, the little Italian sister was singing. He said, when she's done singing, I'm going to kill her. I mean, he's standing right there in front of loading his gun. And she's like seven months pregnant. So I sent a, I sent a note out. I said, tell her, don't stop singing. <laughs> Simple answer, don't stop singing. And she's singing, and, and then she'd wave, not, not, sing, sing, sing. <laughs> Finally... He turned his gun up, and he gave me the bullets, and he walked out. And we'd won a victory. The song of the Lord conquered. 
you know. But every environment is different, so you got to know how you're going to work in that environment. And there are challenges. The churches that are going to have a, a, a direct impact on anything, evangelism, social action, and what? And church planting. That churches need to be aware of where their calling is and how to apply the principle that, that is effective in their city. What are some of the issues you're going to face as leaders? I'm on page 24. You're probably on page 25. We're, we're coming up near the end here. <laughs> we run out of pages. We're done, huh? <laughs> it's like somebody said, we, we, why do you cut the end of the bur- the ham off? I said, because the pan was too small. Don't you know that? You heard that story, didn't you? Right. You know, the, 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 the husband's thinking there must be a real ritual to this and and the daughter, and their mama says, listen, the only reason I, I cut the ends of the hams off because the pan was too small. Then we're not learning. We're, we're watching, but not learning from observation. All right, confronting issues. Leaders in this day are confronting issues that they have never confronted in their life before in the body of Christ. These are not easy days to be a leader in the body of Christ. These are not easy days to be pastoral in the body of Christ. In fact, I have a whole conference we'll probably do maybe in the fall on the crisis in pastoral care. Why good churches lose good pastors and why good pastors lose good churches. There's some principles, dynamics that happen that cause a, 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 a falling away from one another. But there are some issues. Listen. Personal conflict, pride, women, men, money, all of the issues of personal pride, prestige, honor. We, we haven't learned anything from Satan at all. If there's one lesson we should learn from Satan is that pride will get you flat on your face eating dirt. What once, at least I'm told by the theologians, once crept up. On its legs, walking around, talking to folk. I don't know how Adam and Eve put up with talking snakes. See? But what happens when God comes on the scene after the fall? You will crawl on your belly. And you will eat the dust of the earth. Change. Why? Because Ezekiel and Isaiah said there was pride found in the Garden of Eden. That's a whole other text. I, I wish I had time to explore with you. Because evidently, evidently, Satan was in the Garden of Eden. Because the Bible says that in the Garden of Eden, pride was found in him. And when it was found, God came on the scene and made him eat dirt. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. That in due season he will exalt you. You don't humble yourself, he'll de-exalt you. <laughs> you, know, you go the other way. You know, be kind to your brother trying to one song set, because you may meet him on your way down, on his way up. The processes of life. Pride. Relate here this whole issue of dealing, men and women. We all know the stories. We've all seen it on television. We've all hurt with our champions that have been dragged before national TV confessing personal sins and arrogance having to do with relationships to men and women. We've seen them dragged off in chains. We've seen grown men weep before their pulpits and say, yes, I was guilty. I went hunting for a prostitute down where I shouldn't have been. We've seen all of that on on television. It's been a shame to the body of Christ. It's been a shame to those leaders. And you know what it should have done to us? Broke our hearts. Caused us to fall on our face. To say, oh God, help us to be leaders who can recognize. One of the things that's always amazed, amazed me, and those of you that are up and coming leaders, one of the things that's always amazed me, and I keep constantly praying about, is this. How could, in a church full of prophetic people, how could leaders exist and rule over those people in a church full of prophetic leaders now? And yet, those prophetic leaders not recognize. That man ain't living right. That woman ain't living right. That lady in the front row, that's his girlfriend. But his wife's sitting in the other row. How can that happen with prophetic people? You know how that happens? 
The one, da- the one danger I see in the body of Christ is that we make excuses for our leaders as long as they're performing. Oh, you get, you got to have to think about that one. We make excuses for our leaders as long as we can sense an anointing on them and things are going and the churches are growing. But if the Holy Spirit reveals to us, psst, hey, that's his girlfriend in the back row. No, I rebuke you, devil. That's you, devil. Nobody wants to deal with that. So how can you be in a prophetic environment and nobody, because, like I said, we have a tendency to overprotect our leaders to the degree that we will make excuses for them if we see those failures in them because they're good performers. They, they got an anointing. And, and, then, and then we use, we cop out to the scripture, touch not the Lord's anointing, to his prophets no harm. We take it out of context. When we take it out of context and we supply it anywhere, we misuse the scriptures. I've known leaders that have misused that scripture. Don't mess with me. Do you know what the Bible says? Touch not the anointed. I said, well, I'm sorry, but I'm the anointed too. And you the anointed, and you the anointed, and you the anointed. We all the anointed. And if you are damaging me by your behavior and I'm being wounded, If you're strong and I'm weak and you're wounding me because I'm observing something that I know isn't right and you damage me and I walk away from Christ, then you're in trouble. Because he said, beware that you don't hurt the little ones, the sheep, the, the the little ones. Money, we could spend hours. We could have a whole... Our brother can teach us seminar on money. Maybe we'll have him come sometime and share with us some of his insight and wisdom. See, in the body of Christ, we don't know how to take advantage... Uh, of, of people that are gifted because sometimes we try to do it all. Leaders are bad about that. They become the jack of all trades and the master of none. Rather than gathering a team, this guy's good at this, that gal is good at that, that gal's good at this, this guy's good at that, I'm going to turn it over to them and I'm going to keep marching forward. And then we build a powerful team. A relational conflicts, family, church members, other leaders. If the, if the devil can't get you as a leader, mess you up, he'll go after your family to try to mess you up. If he can't mess you up with your family, he will go after your church family. If he can't mess you up with your church family, he will build a resentment against you from the worldly people. That's the people of this ministry. What the people around here think about, about, you know. They're crazy over there. You know, they're nuts over there. You know what? We're just learning to love God over there. <laughs> Amen? And so you have this uh, the relational conflict, societal conflict. Sometimes the world sees us as charlatans. Sometimes the world sees us as leaders, as money seekers. That's because they don't understand God's concept of giving, giving. But when that's taken out of balance, when giving, giving, seed planting is taken out of balance, then the world looks at us and says, all they want is our money. See, I don't need a $100 line to get people to give. I've actually been in services where they only prayed for people that gave the amount that they called out. If you didn't have that amount, you couldn't get on the prayer line. And I wonder, God, all these broken bodies, all these hurting bodies, they came. And some of them ain't even got a dime to give, but they're not going to get prayer because they didn't have the hundred or the thousand. Or the... That's not God. And the, and the leaders in the body of Christ at some point have to stand up and challenge that. Poverty, homelessness. See, it used to be you pastored in days, in days of old, and probably about the worst you used to have back in maybe the 70s and 60s, you had to go see some, some mama's son who got in trouble with the police or whatever, and, and you needed to bail him out or whatever, and you prayed for them, and they got released, and, you know, they did something crazy in school. Uh, I remember once, I remember uh, when I was a kid, I got bored in class, and they used to have those ink wells. Some of you remember those old ink wells in the classroom? And I started making paper planes and dipping them in there. And I started throwing them at the ceiling. So the whole ceiling was spotted with blue and black. Cost my father 500 bucks for that paint. It cost me my hide. 
<laughs> at, the, at the end of that little, little thing. But we've we got to deal with stuff. Homeless, poverty, distress, broken family, AIDS. We're dealing with stuff today that we never dream. Our, 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 our pastoral offices many times have become uh, almost uh, supersized counseling offices. Pastors are having to spend so much time. In, in Florida, pastors now have a whole department, and they, have, they separate that department from the pastor and keep the two separate, and they have to have bonding for every counselor and, and keep specific records. If somebody from your church comes for counseling, they have to go see somebody, that's, and they have to be licensed to one degree or another to get counseling. Why? Because pastors are terrified of the people these days who like to sue people in the body of Christ. I mean, I'll tell you just like it is. Some of the people that smile real pretty at you. They're just waiting to trip over that chair so they can slap a lawsuit on the church or they can bring an action. It's happening all across America. And so people, we become pastors and leaders have become very guarded. You know, I, I'm a licensed, uh, licensed therapist, counselor, and I talk to people. I talk to people here. You know, I still do it, you know, and, then, and I, I keep my mental notes. Talk to you, okay. And you know, one of the things I learned, if you didn't write it down, it didn't happen. <laughs> if you didn't write it down, it didn't happen. But if it needs to be written down, you better write it down. You better keep a record of that because you never know when that will come back to you. And it, it becomes very costly as a leader because you didn't, you didn't shore up that part of your life. Financial conflict. The war for integrity. Okay? The war for integrity. I'm going to talk about that in our next seminar. What's the character? How am I supposed to look? What am I supposed to look like? You know? When people smell me, what do they smell? The kingdom? Or self-satisfaction? And that becomes a thing. Okay, five, five scriptural realities facing men and women who, who, who would lead others in the future. I'm on page 26. I imagine you're on page 27. Number one, through their influence, leaders have the potential to ruin the future of God's people. You know that? Numbers. You can read the whole Numbers 13, verses 1 through 16. I'll just read the, the first and second verse. And the Lord said to Moses, saying, Send men, send men to spy out the, the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers you shall send it. So the first part is for, it's a good fulfillment. Send somebody up there to see what's going on. The question then comes later. That as these men are sent, you read the story, some of them come back with what? With their personal observations of the conflict before them. There's nowhere in the text, when you read that text, nowhere in the text does it say, you go out there and spy and come back and tell me if we can go in there and do this thing. See, you won't find it in the text. Well, all they were simply asked to do, just go and tell me what's there. So all I want, I want to know what's there. I don't want to know whether, whether, whether or not we can go in there and win. I just want to know what's there. In fact, bring me back some of what's there. And the Bible said they came back with grapes, huge monster grapes, between two sticks, can home stuff, boy. And, and, said that, and, and, they, and, they, and they confessed. The land is great, filled with milk and honey. It's awesome in that land. Man, that food in there is great. But, <laughs> you always got the billy goats in every congregation. But, but them folk over there, big. Remember when basketball players used to be 5'7", five 5'9", five maybe 6 foot, and then they got a little taller. Then they got to be 6'2", six 6'4". Six, nine, and you got, and you had the Will Chamberlains come on the scene and change everything forever. <laughs> you know, they said, who's that tower? Abdul Jabbar, one of some of the other ones, man. They're like towers now. They can stand, they can just raise their hands in front of the basket. <laughs> Whoa, I'm getting out of their way. Except with little Speedy, man. 
Beat him from Atlanta. He had it. Little short. I remember watching him play. Little short dude making up there. <laughs> oh, dunk on you, buddy. <laughs> Get out of my face. You know, uh, there's always one that's saying, man, I'm as big as you in my heart. That's the way we got to be, big hearted, be able to get up there and get up and get up in the sky. But but there are going to be those people who believe that your vision is nice, but the conflicts are too great to carry it out. You know what you got to tell those people? You don't say nothing until it's all done. The pastor in Chicago who was going to build a great church. He had all of his leaders together, and he said, this is what we're going to build. And, and some of them began to, 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 to criticize and to, to say, we can't do this. And this is what he said, I command you in Jesus' name, if you don't have anything good to say about this building program, not to open your mouth till we're done. And if I catch you opening your mouth with a negative word, you're in trouble. He was exercising his leadership. And you know what? All those people that grumble and complain, they shut their mouths. And when that place was built and beautiful and full, they all want to take credit. See, look at our building, man. We built this. No, you ain't built. You, you didn't even want it. <laughs> and now you want to take credit for it. The world is weird, isn't it? Sometimes people won't help you accomplish your vision, but when you've accomplished it, and you become known in the body of Christ, all of a sudden, they, they, they want us. They belong to us. They're from our group. We claim them. They, they are, we send them out. Yeah, you send them out. You tell them, we ain't paying for this. <laughs> you, go, you go on your own. <laughs> okay. Go into God-given vision ahead of the people. That will be important. If you're going to succeed with people, you have to be in the front. But God commanded Joshua and encouraged him and strengthened him. For he shall go over before the people, not behind the people. One of the great things about the Israeli army is that all their captains have to be in the front of the battle. That's why they, they kill so many Israeli generals. Because they have to be in the front. They want them leading the people, not behind the people, behind the scenes with binoculars. Are you there? You winning? <laughs> huh? See, God's looking for some leaders that are willing to get out there in the front and take the beating of life. And, and, and stand up to some, to some things with nobody else. And, and when the people see that, they will rise up. They'll say, that, that's our leader. We're going to stand with him. If he's willing to do that, if she's willing to do that, if they're willing to pay the price, then we will go before them. We'll follow them. So God's looking for leaders who know how to, to go ahead of the vision and lead people forward into the advantages of God. In faith, and I'm, I'm on page 29, you're probably on page 30. In faith, leaders take action in times of crisis. 31? Okay, there you go. You're a couple of pages ahead of me. See, that's because I shrunk the print on mine. When you shrink the print, you get, get more, uh, more, less pages and more print. Huh? And that's the thing that we got to do. Listen, listen. listen. In, 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 in faith, leaders take actions in times of crisis. Read it, Judges 6 and 7. God finally found a man, a discouraged man. Isn't it ironic that when God decides to do something powerful, that he, he has to find somebody who is in personal crisis over whether or not God can do something. He found Gideon, and, and Gideon raises the question. Well, the children of Israel begin to cry out in the middle of the text. And the children of, uh, of Israel cried out to the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel. You cry out, God answers. Who does he send? A leader. He sends a prophetic leader. I personally believe that God is raising up a whole army of prophetic leaders. Now, that doesn't mean that they are all prophets. That means that they have prophetic insight. They know where the body of Christ needs to go, where they need to take them. And they're strong. 
They are what I call the velvet-covered brick. On the outside, soft and cuddly. On the inside, steel and concrete. Titanium on the inside. <laughs> Got that velvet on there? That's a, you know, the velvet-covered brick. I can love you. I can let you feel my warmth and my thing, but if I have to stand up, get out of the way, <laughs> you know, things, things can get tough. And that's a good leader, a leader who knows his strengths and a leader who can take charge and a leader who can, who can bow and say, okay, it's, this is not a good war for me to fight. Why we can squabble over this? It's just a little incident, and the incident of all, of all of life, it doesn't really matter, so let's pass beyond that. Let's go to something else. So he raises this man, but this man, Gideon, raises a question. God, where are you? You're the God of miracles. I don't see you doing a thing. So God will find a, a, a crisis leader, a leader who is himself almost beginning to question whether or not God is interested in doing anything. And God will begin to talk. And God will begin to share. And God will reveal the plan as he did to Gideon. And when he reve revealed that plan to Gideon, Gideon was ready. He, he carried out the acts of God because he knew. Now see, I'm clear on page 42 already. <laughs> you're, you're up on 44. All right, this is what it says. A leader endures... When others quit from exhaustion. Sometimes you feel like you're the only one. Only man, only woman standing. Remember Elijah? God, I'm the only prophet. <laughs> Nobody else wants to be prophetic. And when I get prophetic, look. She's chasing me all over town. Man, I'm tired of this stuff, God. I want to die. <laughs> and a small, still voice comes and talks to him. Isn't it ironic how God waits till he shuts up? Sends the wind and the rocks and and, he said, and God was not in that. That's because we get so used to the noise of, of the activity in the body of Christ and then God says, I want to talk to you. And in that moment, God said to him, listen, there's a whole bunch just like you. They've just been hanging out in the cave over here. They're about to come out of that cave and get out of the cave ministry and go out public and touch lives. You're not by yourself. But sometimes leaders can feel it. But in those kinds of moments, a leader, he has to learn to endure when others are exhausted. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 30. If you read through that, starting at verse 6, now David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him. <laughs> the cost of leadership. Sometimes people want to kill you. Because of the soul of the people was grieved. Every man for his sons and his daughter. The whole great battle. Everybody was taken away. Comes home to camp and nobody's there. And now these, these are warrior men. These, these ain't no kind of sit around. These are warrior men. They ain't about to run from nobody. And they stand up and they say, You know, uh, David, uh, we about to pick up some stones and you're about to get them upside your head. If you don't get us back our wives and our children... Uh, we're going to put a hurting on you. So the Bible said there was great distress in the camp. But now watch. Every man, for, they was distressed for his sons and his daughters. But David, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. How did David strengthen himself in the Lord his God? Sing. I like this. See, David began to sing. We had that whole singing anointing down, man. He'd been doing this for years. <laughs> he could break into a song anytime. He'd been singing them psalms and, and the hills singing to the lions and the sheep. Every sheep, in, every sheep in the valley knew David's song. They'd be singing these songs. And he breaks out in a song. Then they, they, uh, he said, uh, but they, David said, they, I'm sorry. Then David said to Abiath the priest, uh, Himelech's son, uh, you know, bring the ark. And the ephod here, David cries out. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I overtake this troop? I mean, he just breaks on his little song. He, I'm go God, how about it? We're going to do it. We're going we to conquer, ain't we, God? And he strengthens himself. The, the Hebrew says he invigorated himself. In other words, he showed strength of character. 
by not caving in, not running. One of the great, actually two of the great generals in the revolution who, who were real cocky. They thought they had it all under control. We're going to win the battle. They wanted to be the head chief. Both of them ran in battle in disgrace. One of them was court-martialed from running from the battle. But he was, let me in there. I can do this thing. It didn't work that way. It, God has another way uh, of applying to life. But you've got to strengthen yourself. Again, I'm on page 45. I don't know what page. <laughs> A little further down. Unconquered carnality causes leaders to forfeit their privileges. Unconquered, what page is that on there? 47. Unconquered carnality will cause leaders to forfeit their privilege. And the story is given to us of Mo. My wife hates it when I call him Mo. I have more respect, she said. He's Moses, leader of Israel. I said, yeah, Mo's all right. You know? Uh, uh, he allows the attitudes of the people. He allowed the attitudes of the people to bring him to a place of anger. Now, you've got to understand that this man already has, needs anger management. He had anger, he had anger issues all his life. Somebody said, how could he be such a powerful leader? He had anger issues. That's why he killed a man. That's why he ran into the desert angry with himself that he killed a man. He comes on the scene, he can get rough with Israel. And finally, Israel, you know, you read that verse in Deuteronomy, and Moses was the, the hum most humblest man, the meekest man in the Bible. Well, if we believe what we believe as conservative Bible believers, then we believe Moses wrote that. He wrote that about himself. You, you know, I, I'm really the meekest man in the world. I said, you prove it, you know. I mean, you're out here. They get him so angry, he grabs that stick. He said, I've had it with you. Bang, bang. And God said, you should know how to do that. Why? Yeah, he did. But he never, he never fully conquered his anger issues. And it cost him what? Instead of being the man that not only brought Israel out of their bondage, forever known as Moses. Even in Israel today, Moses. Even if you go to the big Islamic temple, the temple there that's in Jerusalem, his name is written Moses in that temple. So is the name of Jesus Christ. And so is the name of Muhammad. It's all of, inscribed all the way around the inside of that temple. Even the name of Jesus. And so he, he marches out. Going to the promised land. I mean, the milk and honey. Some covenant stuff, man. They're going to lay back. But because he decided to do it his way with anger rather than talking. God told him to talk to the rock. He didn't say strike the rock the second time. He said talk to it. He got, ah, there's your water. Uh, Mo, yes, sir? He said, that you got a young man over the name Josh? I sure do. He said, well, you better lay hands on him because you ain't going where he's going. Let me tell you something. I have known great leaders who have been in that position, and they've had to pass on to others, young leaders, because they knew they had blew it. They knew they would never again rise to the level they had once been because Father had put a, fence around them. This is how far I'm going to let you go now. And they knew they had to, re and the hardest thing for a great leader like that is to actually find somebody that he knows has his heart. How do you know Joshua had his heart? Read about it. Moses came out of the tent after talking to God. Who went in there after Moses came out? Joshua ran in there all the time. People sometimes miss that, that Joshua ran in there all the time. Every time Mo left, Joshua went in. That's the reason God allowed him to be put in that place. The blessing of leadership, and we'll be done and we'll pray. 
A leader's ability to change and to help others change will determine his success in this era. I encourage you to, if you can, get the book on leadership by Frank DiMazio. It's a very powerful, powerful book talking about some of the principles that I've talked about and other principles. Uh, it's a book by Frank DiMazio on leadership. He pastors in Portland, Oregon. They have over 200 churches that gather every single month in that city as one body to praise and worship. Imagine. I don't know of any other city in this country that can gather 200 churches to come together to worship every month together and to celebrate God. And, uh, and so there are primitive. Luke 12. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning and you yourself be like men who wait for their master. Then he goes on in the text and said, Blessed are those servants whom his master, when he comes, will find them what? Watching or working or active. Now, this is what he says. When he comes, you need to be dressed. Put on the whole armor of God. You may fight in the battle. You need to be ready for service. Occupy till I come. The word occupy, translated out of the Greek, literally means work. Work. Work till I come. He said, keep your lamps burning. In other words, stay spirit-filled. Stay full of the Holy Ghost. Maintain. That, that's what he says in Ephesians. Be being filled with the Holy Spirit daily. Activating, one of the practices that my dear friend in North Carolina does in their fellowship and among their people, they have a mandate from God. They do out of, I believe, out Jeff Johns. Every day, everybody who understands the vision prays in the Spirit for one half hour. Every day, everybody, without fail, one half hour every day praying in the Spirit. It's no wonder when they come together, the house explodes and the glory explodes and and the miracles take place, and people, people do. Uh, I saw a man take off his brace, his back brace. Lit, an unsaved man in the back of Jeff John's truck. He lit, during an offering yet. Can you imagine God healing somebody during an offering? He took this back brace off and ran up and put money in the offering and gave his heart to Jesus. I mean, that's cool. God, do it again. Bring some more. You know, I like that. You know, that, that's a good way to do it. He said, be watching. In other words, be alert. Because you never know which way God's going to move next. You never know from which direction the Father's going to come. Sometimes it's in a song. Sometimes it's in an offering. Sometimes it's at the end. Sometimes it's at the beginning. Sometimes the demons will decide to like you in the middle, the end, and, and at the end, in the beginning. <laughs> I've seen them, you know, at every, every, every level. Luke 12, 22. Then he said to his disciples, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. The greatest lesson you and I are going to learn is to trust him. He knows how to take care of you. But look at the lilies of the field. He said, you, you're way behind the times, man. He said, I'm still dressing flowers of the field. And every year I can bring up a new species. And the, and the botanists are going to the jungles and finding all kinds of... I had an orchid that came out of the deepest jungle in the Philippines. Now, you ain't seen all, you see these little orchids, and you ain't seen nothing To one of those tribal people brings you an orchid deep out of the jungle, and it's a deep purple, and he pins it on you, you know, and, and I'm wearing it around for days. I thought, oh, this is awesome. The beauty in the, uh, uh, that comes out of that. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, according to the promise of life, which is what? In Christ Jesus. Leaders understand. Leaders understand that God has endowed them with life and life more abundantly. The spirit of resurrection. We talked about the the inner glory shining out. I once prayed for a man, and I always remember this. Sometimes I find myself praying this when I pray for people. I just simply said to him, May the spirit of resurrection that lives in you drive out of you every bit of infirmity. And he was instantly healed. 
I fell out. When I came to, he was healed. I don't know where that prayer came. It just came up out of my spirit. The spirit of resurrection that's in you. The spirit of life. God has ordained life for you. Great leaders are known for what? For the students who surpass them. See, our calling is to do what? To raise up some leaders. And then to sit back as the master teacher and say, wow, look at them. They're awesome, man. I got one of my students. He ran for mayor of Birmingham. Missed it by only 2%. He told me, next time, I'm going to be mayor. I got students all across this country that I've worked with and people that, that we've discipled. They're just going all over the world preaching the gospel. I'm happy. Some of them are doing greater works than I could even imagine. I could never imagine myself doing what they're doing, and they're doing it. I'm not jealous. I'm just extending the kingdom of God. Go for it, man. Do it, man. If God, God will use you, go for it. I hope you all I can. Encourage you. Support you. Do whatever. Go for it. It doesn't, doesn't bother me. You know? Uh, I've got some people that are pastoring churches now. that They're doing awesome works. In the Philippines and the United States. Doing awesome works. I like it. You know what that says? Somehow... I did something right. And that's what I want to leave you with this, 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 this afternoon as we come to the noon hour. Do something right. A friend of mine, when he got to be 40 years old, some of you are not quite 40 yet. Some are beyond 40, and some wish you could get back to 40. <clears throat> I'm a little beyond that. I, I made 65. I'm, I'm racing towards 120. <laughs> Uh, uh, but he's saving. God called his name, called him by name. He called him by name. He said, now don't do something stupid like Moses when he was 40. And he stopped shaving. And, he said, Lord. and the Lord said it again. Now don't do something stupid like Moses when he was 40. To sabotage his forward progress. So he had to wait another 40 years so God could bring him back as an old man. He was strong because the Bible said his eyes weren't dim and his physical health. But when you 80, you 80. I'm telling you, when you 80, you, I don't care how strong you are, you 80. Your bones don't move so fat. I'm 64 and I know that. You don't move so fat. But you know him. And I think that's the challenge from God to you. And as, as he wants to raise us up as leaders. Each one of us has the potential our own way. Uh, one of the greatest leaders I know is my wife. I very rarely talk about my wife, but she's a great leader. I want to tell you why I believe she's a great leader. She raised three children who have been to college or university, has successful families and successful careers, and love Jesus. What more could you want? What more could you want? That you raise children to seek the face of God? And they're raising their children to seek the face of God? And they're not taking from society. They are what? Reaching out in Jesus' name. Let's be the hands of Jesus. That's what we need to be, the hands of Jesus. Somehow touching some, Find somebody. Everybody in this room has a potential. I challenge you to find at least one person in your world, a neighbor, a friend, somebody, and spend at least one year just sharing with them the revelations that God has given to you, the truths that you've written down, that you've stored away. Oh, let me show you this. Let me make a little coffee cake. Come on over here, man. You can come over to my house, man. You know, we, we, we're, going, we're going to eat good. You know, that's why I got to go see my buddy down there dressed, man. I can get some of them shakes, brother. I need the, 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 all them vegetables. <laughs> you know, I came home, I lost seven pounds. <laughs> I've lost eight pounds, and this last week somebody gave me something else to try, and, and uh, I'm doing good. But, uh, but see, that's the thing. Different people have learned different things, and we've learned things that have matured us. If they were good enough to mature us, let's find somebody that we can begin to train. 
And I believe that's where the body of Christ has let down. They have failed to pass on their vision. You know why the church in, down in Houston is going on? Because his daddy prepared his son. That's why that's a great church. We're nearly 40,000 now. His daddy prepared him. And he's preparing his children after. In fact, his son already told him, Dad, this church ain't big enough. <laughs> <laughs> What's, what, that, what does that mean? That means that his son has already caught the vision. Yeah. This church ain't big enough, Dad. We're going to need more room. You're going to need a bigger stadium than this. All right. You pass it on. They pass it on. You build a group of people. And always remember, they don't belong to you. They belong to Jesus. You're not the Lord over them. Jesus is the Lord. You're just simply God's helper to help build a working body. And I pray somehow the body of Christ catch the vision that we've got to build such a working body that our cities, our towns, Hagerstown, whatever, Philadelphia, all around us, Harrisburg, that our cities are impacted. We still are not to that level in most of America where the body of Christ is working with one another. And leaders are praying with one another. And leaders are broken before one another. And leaders are saying, this is what needs to happen in our city to raise up the glory of the Lord. Father, I thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Why don't you just bow your head a moment and, and think about all the many things that, have been, that I've said. I trust that something that's been said has impacted your life. And I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to just manifest in your life. Romans 12 says there is a gift of government. A gift of rulership. A gift of leading. And I'm going to ask God through the power of the Holy Spirit to move in your life so that he would begin to activate that gift in your life. That the gift of government, the gift of rulership, the gift of leadership would be activated. And I want to lead you in a prayer and we're going to pray together. I'm going to ask God to do that for us. And then we're going to thank him that it's going to start right now. As soon as we pray this prayer, it's going to begin to be activated. And we're going to go forth from here and be a help to our pastors, be a help to those that are in need, that need to be trained. We're going to go out and impact the world around us. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, I thank you today that I've learned that leaders are made by you. Calling is by you. I thank you today that you qualified me to be a leader. And I ask you, Lord, to activate in me the gift of government, the gift of rulership, the gift of authority, that I may go forth in your name, by your authority, and change the world around me. Help me, Father. To humble myself, that in due season, you would lift us up. Thank you, Lord. Come on, thank him, thank him. Hallelujah! Glory to God! Glory to God in the highest! On earth, peace towards men. Now, I just want to thank all of you uh, that made it. Uh, each time we hope that it keeps growing and growing. And I'm hoping it